very much creatures of habit. Did you want to stand up in that last song? <laughs> Those little simple things that make no difference one way or the other are good to tell us, though, that we need to watch ourselves on serious things because we are creatures of habit. It's one reason it's good to remember that as soon as possible in life, make it a habit to love and obey God. And as you grow older, it becomes just the way you live. We have been over the last many Sundays dealing with marriage, divorce, and remarriage. The last few Sundays, after having set out the truth of God on what marriage is, and then what he had to say, especially Matthew 19, 9, and prior to that, 6, and then Matthew 5, 32, we looked at divorce and remarriage and false doctrines that try to get people around what the Lord said to allow them to stay in marriages that are not authorized by God. I would like to conclude that series today with one last error that has been offered. And this uh, argument is sometimes made from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I say again, it's an attempt to justify a marriage in which two people are united, one or both of whom are divorced for reasons other than fornication of Matthew 19, 9, or because one was the guilty party put away for fornication, having no authority to contract a Matthew 19, 6, God joined marriage. And then after the marriage, they hear the gospel taught, they believe it, and they go through the forms of obeying the gospel. And that's all all right according to this doctrine. Because since they were, listen, called by the gospel, while they were in such a marriage as I just described, it'd be all right for them to remain in that marriage. And then they quote Paul, and they say verses, or they quote verses 17 through 24 of 1 Corinthians 7. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all the churches. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any man called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. And then here is their punchline. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Now, to make this injunction, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called, apply to a sinful situation is nothing less than a terribly wicked resting of the scriptures that Peter warned about in 2 Peter 3 and verse 16. That Greek word for resting there means actually torturing the scriptures. When we don't rightly divide the word of truth or for some other reason we mishandle the truth, then God sees that as us with the truth on a torture rack torturing it. That's what W-R-E-S-T-I-N-G, resting, means. So whether one were circumcised, as Paul taught in these verses, or uncircumcised, now watch it, had not one thing in the world to do with faithful service to Christ. Whether one were a slave or a free person, again, for emphasis, had not one thing in the world to do with one's being a Christian, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament. Now, whether one were married or unmarried, Matthew chapter 19, 6, God joined marriage, would not change one's responsibilities to Christ. One is not forced to come out. Now listen, this is what Paul's teaching. One is not forced to come out of a scriptural, a legitimate calling in order to be a Christian. 
but a legitimate calling can't be a sinful calling. Or else what's repentance for, folks? You repent of sins. And that's all Paul is saying in this as to what God requires of one to become a Christian. But now, if one is in a sinful situation, that person must come out of that sinful situation. If you're a liar, you got to stop lying. If you're a thief, you have to stop stealing. If you're an adulterer, what's the rest of it? You have to stop living in adultery. If it doesn't involve one being married, but if it's just two unmarried people, never been married, and they're committing fornication, that's sin. Well, if you obey the gospel in that plan of salvation after having believed, the command is that all men everywhere must repent, Acts 17, 30, you've got to stop the fornication. It has nothing to do if you're driving a Corvette. You don't have to give it up necessarily if you've got a collection of guns. You don't necessarily have to give it up. If you've got a good job and the job itself doesn't contradict God's will, you don't have to give it up. If you're a slave in the Roman Empire and you hear and obey the gospel, you don't necessarily have to say, well, now I won't be a slave. Now, go back to where he was saying circumcised, uncircumcised. That's basically saying if you're a Gentile and you hear the gospel and you obey it, being uncircumcised, you don't have to become circumcised. You see, that's also a strong strike at the Judaizing teachers who would have the Gentiles be circumcised in order to be a Christian. But he would say to the Jew, now, if you're circumcised, then don't think that you have to do otherwise to become a Christian. In other words, it's not obligatory upon you in order to gain remission of sins and be faithful to God. So to pull this text, that's resting it, out of its context, thus it becomes a pretext, and to make it allow for sinful activity to be acceptable is to destroy repentance as one of the steps of salvation. And to say, just keep on keeping on whatever you were doing. Many years ago, oh, I don't know how many years ago, close to 45, I guess, I had a little debate in Fort Smith, Arkansas, with a brother who had preached us a gospel meeting there, and we picked up on what he was saying and met with him, the elders and I did, regarding what he taught about 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And out of that grew this debate that we had at the church building where he preached in Fort Smith while I was, in, I was preaching in Van Buren, Arkansas. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 6, and this also ties in with one of the other errors that we dealt with earlier. He tried to use this and say that it meant whatever marriage you were in when you were baptized then that was acceptable to God, and that would tie in with the 1 Corinthians 7 we just spent time on. But here's what he did. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 6. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. In other words, don't believe a lie. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous. By the way, look at the list in which he puts covetous people in. Look, look at their company and tell you, and that I'll tell you something how God looks at covetous people. Nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to heaven. It says at Galatians 5, the works of the flesh. Now watch what he says in the next verse, verse 11. And such were, were past tense, am I right? And such were some of you. Some of the church at Corinth had been converted and had these kind of backgrounds. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit 
of our God. Now here's how I use that passage. Going back to what we said before. You've been married five or six times, or you're married only once, as far as civil law is concerned, but you never had a right to marry any of them. That is, none of them were authorized by the New Testament contract of marriage. Now in those days, nobody thought about homosexual marriages being legalized. And that would pose a problem for the last verse we looked at. Just stay in the same situation you're in when you're baptized. Because if you were converted as two homosexuals, then you could stay that way according to the previous one. Well, here it gets you in also. Because his view was that when you're baptized then that takes care of everything. But he didn't again look at repentance. He didn't know what repentance meant. Here was a man preaching the gospel, and he was a very capable man when it came to delivery. But he had no idea what repentance was. Thus his idea was, you'd be any of these things, marriage included, that's not authorized by the Bible, and you're baptized, you just stay in that marriage. It's okay. Well, there's a chart that we had that I got from a, another debate. And it has, on this side, we put fornicator. What is he? It was at the top of it. He's a fornicator. Then right here, why? He commits fornication. Then up and down here, we put baptism. And then over here, we said, what is he? And we put fornicator. And why? He commits fornication. He, he's a wet fornicator. There hasn't been any changing. So we just went right down the line on fornicator. Idolater. Why? He worships false gods. He's baptized. He worships false gods. What is he? He's still an idolater. Well, we brought that down to adulterer. He's an adulterer. Why? He commits adultery. Of course, we went into more detail to what it is to commit adultery. He's baptized. He in, continues to commit adultery. What is he? He's an adulterer. And he balked at that. Now, let me tell you what I mean by balk. He wouldn't notice it. And when I realized that the logic of the matter and the plain truths of the Bible and together is what you do when you preach the word, was poking him so hard, and I'm using his terms there, he simply wouldn't notice it. So I just kept the chart up. I'd go down that chart every time I got up there. Regardless of whatever else I said, I went down that chart. And I said, you're not noticing the chart. Now, why is that? The first time he noticed it, he did this. He said, all right, Brown's been talking about me not noticing this chart. I'll just go over and look at it. And he said, now there's this chart. Isn't it nice? It does a good job. And he went right back saying the same thing all over again. So I just kept pressing. I just kept pushing. And I kept emphasizing. And finally he gets up and says, Brown, you're giving me a stomachache. You're punching me so hard. Well, I also brought out Romans 6 because it wasn't me personally doing it. Didn't he know as a gospel preacher that was the truth of God punching him in the stomach? Really, it was hitting him in the heart. Yes, he knew. He made it obvious. You know, the way a person deals with questions tells you a whole lot about their integrity or the lack of it. That's one reason it's questions and debates. Well, we went to Romans chapter 6, where Paul is talking to the church at Rome, reminding them of what they did when they became Christians. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, in the Greek it's may it never be so. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Well, if you're an adulterer, because you commit adultery and you're baptized and you commit adultery, that means you're still an adulterer. 
Sounds like to me, if I know the definition of continue, a state that goes on, then you're still continuing in sin. And we decided to use these terms again to punch that much harder. The inspired apostle Paul said, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul said, God forbid. Johnny says, Go at it. Now, for some reason, he didn't appreciate that very much. And then we dropped back to the chart, and we punched some more. And that was the end of that. When it all came to an end, it was the end. That's the reason you'll not find, whether it's the other errors that we dealt with on these Sunday afternoons or this one, that these fellows rarely want to debate. And if they start public discussions, it won't take long before they will stop them because the truth punches awful hard. That's the reason we don't have any public discussions, the fundamental reason we don't have any public discussions with the denominations much anymore. We have been getting some debates with atheists and such like but I predict they're going to back off after a while they have too much to lose if you've got Hollywood and all the news outlets companies on your side and you got the government for the most part on your side and you got all the universities and school systems on your side why should you hazard yourself to where you have to put yourself up and have your doctrine scrutinized and exposed because you're going to come to the same conclusion after a while that Johnny did, that you're punching too hard. That's exactly why. And that's why even in the church or in other matters of error, when you start dealing with it, rarely will the champions of those errors want to have it in a public discussion with somebody they know that can expose them for what they are and put the pressure on them for the false teachers they are. They're already making too much headways by good words and fair speeches and looking pretty and smelling good and with a lot of academic titles behind their names. Brethren, the marriage and the home. I mentioned the church this morning, the evils of denominationalism, but marriage and the home is too important. The roles of husband and wife, the responsibilities of husband and wife one to another, when they are joined together as husband and wife. And remember, it's God that does it. God joins a man and woman together to be husband and wife. It's not just the agreement of the man and woman, though they're eligible for marriage, that joins them together. It's when they hold themselves out at some point to be, from henceforth, husband and wife, God joins them together, and they are. And God is the only one who can disjoint them, if you please. And Matthew chapter 19, verse 9 tells us that when one spouse commits fornication, the innocent of fornication spouse has the authority to put the guilty party away. Now, it doesn't have to be. I would always say to somebody like that, if y'all still loved one another to get married in any way and this happened, however it happened, you better work with one another before there's actual divorce. If that won't work, that's fine. There can be situations happen to where the trust is so broken and no indication at all there's any hope. And I'm afraid in most cases that's the way it is then the innocent party has the authority of God Almighty to put that person away because God dissolves that marriage right there. And the innocent party has the authority from God to contract another marriage with an eligible person. God is protecting the innocent party when he does that. Now, there are a few churches, I'm ashamed to say, that are really emphasizing these things and studying them regularly. And it touches too many people. It may not touch just the members in an audience like this, but it's going to touch kids and brothers and sisters and sometimes mothers and daddies. And we, it's just so easy to just leave it alone, not get too detailed. And everybody stay at peace with one another. And thus we become, like the prophet of old said, they're crying peace, peace, 
when there is no peace. Unless you have peace with God, and that comes by gaining it on his own terms, then there's no peace anywhere. If you have peace with yourself, you're going to have to have peace with God. And to have peace with God, you've got to do it on His own terms, the gospel terms, and the plan of salvation, and in godly living in the church to which He adds you when you're obedient to the gospel and are baptized into Christ. Marriage is ordained by God for the happiness and the well-being of mankind. The home is ordained of God as the basic unit of of all other social institutions. No wonder Satan wants to destroy it because with it goes all sorts of things. It's the basic training ground for life. I wish we understood that. In the home, then, one learns the, the skills necessary to interact with fellow human beings. A poor home life as a child is extremely difficult to overcome in later life. Now you can, but you'll always bear those scars. One of the best things I can say to you is, fine, you bear physical scars and you go ahead and lead a good life. Then you're going to have to bear some emotional scars and go ahead and by your own will submit to God's will. But it'll be there. It'll be hiding in the background in the wings all your life. And you'll have to deal with it. May not be your fault. Most times not. But the point is, it's there. And the worst thing in the world is to act like it's not. Thing to do is deal with it. That's gone. That's over. I wish it hadn't happened. I had no choice usually in the matter as a child. But it happened. I'm going to make sure that I realize that about my life and ongoing, it's not going to be that way. I'm going to make sure of that. The home shapes our lives, then for good or bad. It determines our success or failure in life and affects our eternal destiny. How crucial it is that marriages be according to God's will and that homes function as God would have it function. The roles of husband and wife, father and mother, and parents. And it's primarily each home's responsibility to teach that to their children. The home is ordained by God. And I need not say this, you know it, but for emphasis I say it, it's being attacked on every side today. And you can just simply look around you and see all the trouble on every news broadcast and telecast. And you will see that a lot of it goes right back to the kind of, and I hesitate to even call them homes, homes that people came from. There are even those predicting, and there have been, I, it won't happen, but to a certain extent with a lot of people it will, that the home will not survive. We must follow God's law. I how can I emphasize that more than what we emphasize it here? On everything, but especially on marriage. And we must do it without addition, subtraction, or alteration, uh, veering to the right or to the left hand of truth. We must seek to harmonize our home with God's holy word. False teachers, whether they're in the church or out of the church, who teach contrary to the will of heaven on the home, marriage and the home, must have their mouth stopped. Titus 1, 10 and 11. I've often said one of the greatest qualifications of a faithful elder is for him to realize he's a mouth stopper. That's what Paul told Titus to teach. He left Titus, that preacher, there to ordain elders. And in the qualifications given there and by Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, one of them is that false teachers' mouths must be stopped. Now, in the Greek language, that means that they're crammed so full they can't wiggle their tongue. That's exactly the force of the word. Now, God said that, folks. God said that. Now, let me ask you. Is he going to say different on the day of judgment? So it must be done. Is it pleasant? You know, I went to the dentist here a couple of weeks ago because I had a problem with the front teeth here. 
and he gave my mouth an examination. I had an old crown. Yeah, I do have a crown. I had an old crown <laughs> on one side on jaw tooth, and he got to looking at it, and he said, you know, that tooth's cracked under that thing. He said, there's going to be a problem there if we don't go ahead and do something about it. So um, he set up to where I have to go tomorrow afternoon, and he's going to supposed to take care of that, at least get the, the, the thing started. Well, that's going to kind of stop my mouth for a while. To some, they will rejoice. <laughs> and hopefully it won't be permanently, and I say that whether anybody else likes that or not. <laughs> but the point is, some things have to be done. And some things aren't pleasant. And this is what it says in Titus 1, 10 and 11. The best way to ensure that our children contract scriptural marriages and order their homes according to God's will is to teach them what the Bible says about marriage, divorce, remarriage. And the home, as God would have it, listen, as soon as they're able to understand it. And that means a godly example before they're able to understand other things. None of us are perfect. Isn't that amazing that we could make such a statement? But God seemed to think that even though none of us are perfect, husbands and wives and fathers and mothers, that we could be faithful and be what he says we ought to be and thus teach our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Nobody is flawless. That's going to be in heaven in a glorified state. But you can be faithful, and God makes up the rest through the blood of Christ. Look at Abraham for a moment, and look at Sarai. Sarai, Sarah. You ever notice how many things that uh, Abraham and her did that are just downright underhanded? You know what made him the father of the faithful? It wasn't those things. It was every time God told him to do something, Abraham immediately did it just like God said. When God's word came to him, he did it. All you have to do is go ahead and look at, uh, look at Isaac. I, I, if you ever read really about Isaac and noticed him, he was the biggest whiner I've ever seen in my life. Not really saying much about what he does, but he whined. You ever looked at him when he goes down to Pharaoh and he introduces himself to Pharaoh and he says, oh, I'm the most miserable person. I come from a long line of miserable people and we just can't help being miserable. That's basically the way he described himself. And lo and behold, look at his wife and look at Jacob. Now, he's a fine character. You're going to look at him. Jacob, he'll catch her. Subverter. And with his mother, they lied to Isaac. Just read all of that. Well, then how is it there of the lineage of great faith? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, every time God spoke and told them to do something, no matter what it was, they did what he said in the way he said it and for the reason he said it without question. That's a system of faith. So when it comes to marriage, when it comes to the home, when it comes to teaching your children and training them and setting a godly example, you won't be everything you ought to be in the sense of flawlessness. But you can be everything God said you ought to be. Let me say it again. You can be everything God said you ought to be. And that's what we're after. You know why we're after that? Because that's what God wants. And we ought to be after everything God wants. Now, if you'll take that principle and apply it to Christian living in general, then you'll see it works the same way. Have you ever noticed, and I'll let you go with this, because that's another sermon, and I may preach it. Look at Joseph. I mentioned him. I'll at least give you this assignment. Go back and read the life of Joseph and find where he did one thing that was wrong. 
Jeff, can you do that? Just see if you can. Now look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But look at Joseph. See if you can see that. Now you know the way it would be if, we were, if Joseph were American. He would have done something wrong, and he said, but, but look at my daddy, look at my grandpa, and look at my great-grandfather. What do you expect? You don't find that with Joseph. In fact, you might sometimes look and just ask yourself the question out of all those who are even held up as great examples for us. How many of them really don't have any error in their lives? You look at Moses, what a great man he was. But Moses sinned. Now, keep that in mind. And just make that your assignment. And look up Joseph and read about it. Well, we close the lesson. I hope it's been helpful. If you're not a Christian, we've studied many times what to do to become one, to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If you're a child of God and you know there's sin in your life, repent of it, confess it, and pray God for forgiveness. That's God's second law of pardon. Know this always. God wants to receive you. God wants to forgive you. God wants you in heaven with him. He's provided everything he can for a, for a person with free will to get to heaven. If you're subject then to the blessed invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.